Welcome back to part two, where we're going to look at corporate social responsibility. So we've been talking about um, corporate social responsibility in terms of the, um, the, the term corporate. And I apologize for that little typo in the corporate social responsibility slide there. But that corporate is about social responsibility, which we use the acronym CSR. That, that term CSR, even though it is applied to, to corporations, um, is quite often also applied to other entities as well, which is a bit of an oxymoron. But anyway, when we talk about CSR, we're going to look at a couple of lenses. Previously, one of the CSR lenses that we did discuss in terms of sustainability was triple bottom line when we looked at the social, environment and economical um, balanced bottom lines. Um, we're going to be moving on pretty quickly to another one, another lens of CSR, which is Carol's Pyramid. And then we're going to be talking also about stakeholder theory. So let's have a quick look at Carol's Pyramid. And I strongly encourage you to delve into this more through your own research and also the textbook and resources that we supply. So Carol's Pyramid, a broad definition of it that's from our textbook, is the attempt by companies to meet the economic, legal, ethical, and philanthropic demands of a given society at a particular point in time. So that, that covers a lot of area, but gives us a nice little framework to start looking at CSR. So if we look at Carol's Pyramid, which seriously is a pyramid, so the shape of it is this pyramid, okay, and it has a hierarchy. So the, it actually moves up this pyramid in terms of the hierarchy. So these two entities down here, the economic responsibilities and the legal responsibilities are required by a society. So for example, in Australia, you have to be financially viable to be legally operating a business. So that's required by a society, all right? So those bottom, bottom two levels of that period pyramid and needed before you can progress up and then we start to go into it's the level of ethical responsibilities where we start to look at those um, theoretical lenses and what's expected by society now the final one is the philanthropic responsibilities which are desired by society so that's almost like the epitome of the pyramid where you're actually starting to, you've got those foundations of the legal and economic, you've moved through ethical responsibilities, and now you're looking at philanthropic responsibilities. The, one of the entities, the, the organizational entities that's um, a growing phenomena is social enterprises. And you'll see that they don't necessarily abide to, um, they, they might start with a, a more balanced approach where it's economic, legal, and philanthropic, okay? So the ethical is drawn into it. So when you've got an organization that actually looks at more of a, a social or environmental foundation, then you're going to probably see more of a balanced approach. But according to Carol's Pyramid on a traditional corporation, this is the um, view of corporate social responsibility. Okay, so some of the, the CSR strategies and corporate social responsiveness. Um, when we look at the strategies of CSR, we can go to the traditional models where there's a really strong focus on risk and avoiding risk, being reactive to risk. Uh, you can, if you look back 10, 20 years, it very, very much was dominant where um, the the idea of CSR was all about risk and then react, reacting, like responding to a risk when it actually happened. There was no clear link to value creation with the traditional model and um, it actually comes out of that created value, created shared value. CSR was traditionally a bolted on model, so you had your organisation, um, your corporation, and then it's like, oh yes, we need to avoid risk or we need to react to something or something, something nasty has happened in, in the organization. 
for example, um, one of the examples that comes to mind is BP, British Petroleum. They had the Horizon oil spill. Huge deal, went global in the impacts and also the um, the the devastation it, that it, it gave to the environment. And of course it was off the, the Gulf of um, down near Texas, so it was very um, much influenced by the US there. And what the impacts that it had on that coastline was devastating. BP actually turned around and changed their whole modeling there. They changed their logos. They were no, they're no longer British Petroleum, they're beyond petroleum. And they, they started to go from a CSR as a bolted on model to something that was a bit more contemporary. So when we go into the contemporary CSR, we start to look at proactive behaviors. Um, we look at that clear link to creating value and that value creation being a part of the business model where CSR is actually valued, okay? And it's it permeates into a more holistic model and part of the DNA of a business. So that's when we move from a traditional model, which is essentially a bolted on one, it's not inherent to a contemporary model where we start to see CSR as built in and more embedded in an organization. So outcomes of CSR corporate social re responsibility can mean um, some of these areas that we see that are explicit, there's social pro policies, so we start to see um, codes of conduct, we start to see um, some accountability to programs such as sustainable development goals, um, B corporations, um, and also social programs. So starting to integrate those social programs into that social performance. Also reporting back on social impacts and thinking about those social impacts, how they actually can um, positively impact their communities. So that's a really nice little um, outcome of CSR is some of these corporate social performance, which is, is escalating. You can see it coming through in a lot more larger organizations these days. Quite often they will have social policies and building social programs with philanthropic actions and also engaging in um, positive social impacts. So stakeholder theory of the firm. Um, a good definition of this is this little statement here that it's any group or individual who can affect or is affected by the achievement of the organization's objectives. Now, Ed, Ed Freeman, really lovely guy, have a Google of him, he's, he's done some amazing work, um, is still publishing, um, is writes some really good books, really good articles, and he has been one of the, the key players in developing stakeholder theory of the firm. So it's very much about being a, a, the, a stakeholder affects or impacts or is impacted or affected by the firm. So it's that two-way street of, it's not you, to be a stakeholder, it just doesn't have to be that you're, you're impacted by what an organization does, it's also how you can impact or influence an organization. So for example, a consumer versus an employee. So an employee would be a key stakeholder as they are actually um, very much an influencer of the organization and influenced by the organization. And um, similarly with the consumer, however, the organization possibly um, impacts, if it's a large corporation, the consumer is probably more impacted by what an, the corporation does than vice versa. So when we start to talk about stakeholder theory of the firm, we look at the principle of rights, where the corporation has the obligation not to violate the rights of others. So that's um, those corporate rights are starting to grow and develop with stakeholder theory. 
and also the principle of corporate effect where companies are responsible for the effects of their actions on others. So we start to see a bit of a what a business does and how it, in, how it um, really does work together with other entities including people. So these three maps here give you an idea of what um, if you were going to draw up a stakeholder map it might look something like that. Sometimes they're a wee bit crazy. So we have traditional stakeholders, um, the theory of the firm, stakeholder view, network model. So there's quite a few, we're starting to look at various views of stakeholders. The one on the left here is a traditional view of stakeholders where we start to look at um, a key aspect and then we start to, um, what's the right word, have spokes out to some of those people or things or entities or um, industries which are impact or influence that key item. Then you have the um, other stakeholder model maps here that give you an idea how there's no one true way and also it can be applied to different um, aspects. So let's have a look at those different views, okay? And two key views that we're gonna introduce here are Donald and Preston's where we look at normative stakeholder theory, um, descriptive stakeholder theory, and instrumental stakeholder theory. So this is a, a, um, a key way of looking at stakeholder theory. And when we talk about normative, we talk about um, why the corporations should consider stakeholder interests. So it's a very normative approach in terms that that's what we would expect as a norm. Okay, that's what we expect, how they should consider stakeholder interest. So that means your employees, your, your consumers, your um, uh, suppliers, some of those key stakeholders and how they should be considered in decision making of their corporation. So those stakeholder interests can be impacted. Then we've got descriptive stakeholder theory. And that's whether or how corporations actually do take into account stakeholder interests. So we're describing more of how that, that's, that stakeholder um, is taken into account in terms of their, their interests with the corporation. And then instrumental stakeholder theory looks at the question of whether it's beneficial. Okay, so the advantages for the corporation to consider stakeholder interests. So the instrumental stakeholder theory might even be considered, um, you know, are, are the stakeholder, is the corporation being opportunistic in looking at those particular, particular stakeholder interests? Okay, so those three key aspects of Donald and Preston's view of um, stakeholder th theory, break it down a little bit more and look at it from three different um, levels and three different um, ways of viewing that. Then this bottom one that we have here is Mitchell, Agle and Wood, and they talk about stakeholder saliency. And saliency means the importance, so the importance of the stakeholder. So they look at it through power, legitimacy and urgency. Now, when we talk about power, legitim legitimacy and urgency with stakeholder saliency, we're talking about the power in terms of the power of the position. Now, one example I like to give is, um, for example, with a small um, organization, say a catering organization that's working with a very large, powerful organization like Qantas. Okay, so in that relationship, the inherently Qantas will have the power in that that relationship. And then the legitimacy comes in in terms of a contract and how legitimate that, that actual relationship is in how they influence each other. So if a caterer has a contract in place, then they have a legitimate stakeholder um, influence on that larger organisation and vice versa, Qantas would then have 
a legitimate responsibility and impact on that smaller organization of a caterer. The really interesting one that comes in to play in this theory, this view, is urgency. So the urgency can actually shift the power and the legitimacy. So for example, in the, the, the idea of Qantas and a smaller organization of a caterer, for example, if a caterer um, has, they're one of the caterers in say, for example, a smaller town, let's pick Long Range. So Qantas have a plane out in Long Range, they usually turn them around really quickly and um, you know, drop people off, land there, drop people off, pick people up, and then head back to Brisbane. However, you have Qantas landing into Long Ridge and they have a situation where they have to stay there. Maybe they've blown the front tire, okay? They've got to stay there overnight. So all of a sudden that urgency changes. So that power relationship of the small caterer and possibly having to feed those people becomes a lot more powerful in that situation because they're needed. So there's an urgency that their, their um, skill set, their resources are needed to help Qantas fulfill their um, obligations and responsibility. So the power of that relationship, all of a sudden the caterer will have a stronger level of power with um, their, their um, stakeholder of Qantas. So hopefully that makes sense that that can actually shift and shift that relationship. So why do stakeholders matter? If we look at Freeman, as in um, Ed Freeman and Mr. S um, stakeholder versus Friedman, who is Mr. Shareholder, um, why why do stakeholders matter? Okay, so Milton Friedman. Um, he really looked at shareholders as they all their their only interest is um, the business is only interested in the the shareholders' investment, and the investor, the shareholder, is only interested in um, how much they're getting back out of that organisation. They rarely look at what that organisation is actually doing, um, but their, their their primary care factor is the return on investment. Whereas a stakeholder with Ed Freeman's theory, uh, we have, they start to have a legitimate claim on the corporation. So there's some legal perspectives and there's some economic perspectives. So the legal perspective, say for example, with an employee, they have a stake in the corporation and they have legally, usually le legally binding contracts like with an employee um, bargaining agreement or an employee contract and there's an, there's an explicit um, relationship there where, they, um, where if a corporation employs somebody, they have legal obligations to fulfill um, their commitments as an employer, okay? So for example, you have to pay superannuation, you have to regularly pay your employees, you need to give them a long service leave if they're a long-term employee. They need to have holiday leave. They need to have sick leave. So those that legal perspective, and in that situation, an employee has a stake in the corporation because they're reliant on that corporation for that salary. They're reliant on that corporation um, to to meet their lifestyle needs and fulfil their financial um, obligations. For example, with a mortgage, putting food on the table, paying the power bill. Then the economic perspective, where we've got externalities, so that contractual relationship, and also the problem of agency. So short-term interests of owners versus long-term interests of managers, employees, customers, etc. So quite often when we, this agency problem, the short-term interest of owners as shareholders, they're looking for that immediate, um, almost sugar hit of um, a return on investment. Technically, a shareholder can usually pull out pretty quickly. They just go, they sell their shares, and they're out of there. And that's in contrast to the long-term interests of managers who are looking at the success of the organisation, employees who are looking at a career, they're looking at um, 
you know, gaining some stability in their life, supporting their families. Customers who expect reliability in their goods or services and so on. So that's why stakeholders matter and hopefully that gives you a really good idea as we move on to our discussion point for this section. So as we round out part two, we've been looking at CSR and stakeholders. So I'm asking you to think about this um, in terms of what is the nature of organizations' responsibilities when considering um, corporate social responsibility and stakeholders. For example, why would a business have social or environmental responsibilities as well as financial? Why would they have that to engage with their, their stakeholders? And what differences do you see between a stakeholder view, which is Ed Freeman's, versus a shareholder view? I'm particularly asking you this last point to, to help you clarify you know, free, Ed Freeman with stakeholder versus shareholder with uh, Milton Freeman to really delineate those two. I know when I was studying this um, subject matter quite a few years ago, initially, <laughs> um, I, it took me a while to really put those separately and get them clear. So I'm suggesting it might be a really good idea to do that. So let's leave you there for a few minutes while you answer those and write some notes which are really good for your studying and also engaging with the topic.